Good evening, everyone. I'm very grateful to Councillor Craig Simmons for being with us this evening. Craig was, until recently, Lord Mayor of Oxford, but ceased to be that on Monday. He's an environmental consultant, a writer and practitioner. He's leader of the Green Group and Green Group Shadow for Finance, Leisure, Parks and Sports, Chair of Low Carbon East Oxford, Chair of Magdalen Road Traders and Residents Association, and Honorary President of East Oxford Farmers and Community Market. And I'm amazed he's got time to breathe with all that. He's especially interested in environmental policy and finance issues. And he's an active campaigner against social injustice, war and equality, and is a freeman of the city of Oxford. I'm going to ask you all to keep your cameras off and your microphones off during the talk, but keep the chat open and you'll find the icon for the chat at the bottom of your screen. Type there, please, any question that you have. And at the end of the talk, I will read them out and ask Craig to answer them. Craig is talking to us today about tackling the climate emergency in Oxford. So over to him now. Great. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Sandy, and I hope everyone can, can hear me clearly. Um, and if anything goes wrong, just put a note in the chat. As Sandy said, I was Lord Mayor up until Monday. Um, so, so, um, so it was up, up until uh, Monday. So, but, so the views here are expressed are very much my own. Um, but heavily informed by my work as a Green Party councillor and in particular my work on the Climate Emergency Review Group, which the council set up following the, its own declaration of a climate emergency, which was a motion I, I put to council with my fellow Green councillor, uh, Dick Wolf. So I'm told I've got an hour to speak, so I'll try to speak for a little bit less than that. So we've got time for, for Q&A. Uh, this is a complicated area, so Hopefully I'm not going to throw too many figures at you. I'll try and summarise things as I go through. Uh, but if you do have any, I know it's an area where people have diversity of views and, and opinions and priorities. So I'm very keen that we have time to dig into those a little bit and you get a chance to ask any questions. So, um, so why am I keen to talk about climate change? And Sandy said some of these things in, in the introduction. Well, I, I spent most of my career working as an environmental consultant. Um, uh, it's been sort of, I started off in a quite broad world uh, of sort of environmental health and safety and focused uh, increasingly on, on environment and sustainability issues. Um, I, I co-founded a, a sustainability consultancy here in Oxford in 1996, uh, which eventually led me to sort of being a founding member of Anthesis, which is, has now rapidly grown to become the largest group of sustainability consultants in the world. So we're based all around the world and I, and I currently have a role as their chief technology and metrics officer which means I look at the applications of technology and data to sustainability challenges. I've also been a, a Green Party uh, city and county councillor, currently a city councillor for the last 20 odd years, uh, I said former mayor and during my time as mayor I very much focused on climate change. I'm also a little bit of a, an entrepreneur and an ethical investor and I founded sort of four green businesses and, and written or contributed to, to a number of environmental books. Uh, quite interesting, you'll see on the photograph, I was converted 15 years ago now, it seems only yesterday, I was uh, confirmed the Queen's Award for Sustainability and I still think I have the record of being the only person to cycle into Buckingham Palace to receive the Queen's Award. You can see me there on my bicycle. Uh, they were a bit nonplussed by it. Um, there are no bike racks in Buckingham Palace, I can tell you that. So, um, so I'm going to try to answer two questions, as we said in the sort of introduction to this, this talk that was publicised. You know, what does sort of net zero carbon re mean? And I think it's really important that we define what we're talking about, because lots of words are banded around, you know, zero carbon, net zero carbon, carbon neutral, you know, and, and actually some of these are sometimes a bit of a smoke screen to actually sort of hide what's actually going on and they become more too much of a marking to determine too little of science. So I'm really talking about the application of science based targets to to carbon emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. And then also uh, I'm going to talk a bit uh, about what Oxford needs to do 
to go net zero carbon. So, so what is uh, net zero carbon? So uh, if you um, talk to the, the International Panel on Climate Change, they sort of define uh, net zero emissions as a sort of achieved when sort of what they call anthropometrics or human uh, made generated emissions of greenhouse gases, the atmosphere balanced by removals over a specified period. So you often see graphs like this, which are slightly sort of misleading, but you get the idea is that we should be reducing emissions. That's the blue sort of block going, blue uh, line going downwards uh, as much as possible to mitigate emissions and reduce them as far as possible. And then we need to put in place sort of nature-based solutions, some technology solutions like carbon capture and storage to actually take whatever emissions we can't mitigate and actually remove those from the atmosphere. So overall, there's a sort of net emission, net zero emissions of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Now it's quite easy in some ways to define that for for the planet you know because that's a closed system uh, and um, but actually it's a little bit more difficult to define it for a product or a building or a country even or a council which is what I'm going to try to to, to talk to later. Um, I quite like this sort of bathtub analogy this was first sort of presented by National Geographic because it's quite a nice way of thinking about the climate you know um, and the levers we've got to, to sort of play with, which are relatively simple. You know, if you think of the bathtub as the atmosphere, it's so filling up with, with greenhouse gases. And at a certain level, we're going to see sort of warming going to two degrees and then three degrees and doing the damage that's set out in the IPCC reports. And, you know, that the Cl Paris Climate Agreement, which I'm sure you've all heard of, was an attempt to sort of uh, manage. So, you know, we can stop you know, emissions being generated so we can turn the tap or turn, you know, turn it off as much as we can to stop emissions being generated and we can sort of uh, open up the plug hole if you like to remove emissions um, from through nature or technology as I've said. So the idea is to get those things in balance so that we're not seeing the water levels rise and ideally we're seeing them fall a bit to go back to sort of pre-industrial type levels. So, and it's really, the concept is really simple, as it says, as long as we uh, pour greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, faster than nature drains it out, the planet warms. And that extra carbon does take a very long time to drain out. So, um, as I said, um, it's quite easy in a way to define net zero emissions at a planetary level because it's a closed system. You know, we have the one planet, emissions don't escape, they have to go somewhere. A bit more, more difficult and a bit more challenging when we talk to things like, and this is projects I've worked on, so I worked on Bellew Water, defining that as a carbon neutral product. Uh, that's uh, the um, Clark Carbon Neutral Lab in Nottingham on the campus at Nottingham University. I worked on that, again, a net zero building. Um, these things become quite difficult because where do you set the boundaries? What things do you include in your calculations? Which gases do you include? You know, greenhouse gases like um, methane, do you include methane? Do you include carbon dioxide? Um, and what are the miscible removal technologies? So what is acceptable as to, to remove those emissions from the atmosphere? And how do you do that? And how do you evidence that? Uh, and also you need things to be consistently measurable. <clears throat> it's no good setting a, a net zero target if you simply can't measure. There's no way of measuring where those emissions come from and whether you're successful at, at removing them. And there's also the issues of double counting. You know, if you're in a supply chain, uh, say you're a, a, a business buying Bellu water, a restaurant buying Bellu water, uh, and that's already been uh, a net, it's already a net zero carbon product. Do you include it in your boundaries? How do you even know it's net zero carbon? products you can see all these very complex issues and these are really solved um, whether we're talking about the country level or the company level or the indeed the council city level by standards that's the only way we can really agree like any accounting process we need to agree accounting standards and those have been developed in recent years for countries for companies um, for you know uh, municipalities you know for uh, like like Oxford uh, so, uh, and they've been quite slow to develop, they're still emerging, but most of them are, are fairly usable now and are being used to compare and contrast different areas, different countries, uh, different companies, and to set net zero targets. 
So I, you know, I set myself a target when I was Lord Mayor to be a sort of net zero Lord Mayor. And of course, no one had developed a, car, a standard for measuring net zero carbon law mayors. Uh, so I followed, you know, standard broad principles, all of environmental accounting standards follow of transparency, accuracy, completeness, consistency and relevance. And the hierarchy which pr prioritizes mitigation, either emission reductions over co compensation or offsetting them. So I did all the things I could to mitigate. I used my bike wherever possible. You know, I made extra efforts to participate in low carbon events, um, used a Lord Mayor's hybrid mini car or an electric pool car to get around when I had to use a vehicle. Um, I encouraged video conferencing even pre-COVID. So 10 months of my term of office was pre-COVID and the remaining sort of eight months were within sort of lockdown. And I didn't, uh, I refused all offers to air travel. So I was offered quite a few trips overseas to visit our twin towns or to visit other sort of um, uh, conferences, for example. And I turned those down and offered to send videos instead uh, or join by video conference. Um, overall, the, the emissions are quite low. I reckon it's about 75% reduction on what it otherwise would have been had I accepted all these offers uh, as a normal uh, previous uh, incumbent of the roles had done. Um, and then I, that half a ton, which was a relatively small amount of residual emissions, I, I offset those. So um, when we get to accounting for cities, um, I sort of mentioned the uh, challenges for accounting for cities. Um, and there is that standard, which, which I pointed to, the Global Protocol for Communities, which uh, works for cities like Oxford. And there are tools like Scatter, uh, which is what I'm showing you some screenshots for, which are sort of standardized ways of measuring. And I had something to do with the development of Scatter. It's developed by my company and it was also used in Oxford. It's available free to anyone with a gov.uk email address and you can just log in and look at your local authority and set your own trajectories and pathways to net zero, looking at a range of different options, interventions that you can make in there, all areas, whether it's domestic, whether it's industrial, whether it's waste, transport, agriculture, and you can look at things relevant to your area. It uses standard government data sets and the huge advantage with that is these are consistent data sets that have been around since 2005. So you can actually see and the government's committed to keep those updated so you can actually see changes over time from 2005 uh, onwards so i've put the link there if people are interested in finding out a little bit more about that data so on to oxford what what uh, what does oxford need to do to go net zero carbon obviously that's a, a big challenge um uh, so what I'm going to try to do when I go through this is avoid the blame game. It's very easy and it's often used as an excuse for inaction to, you know, city council to blame the county council or the county council to blame the city council, both of them to blame the general public for not doing what they should do. Businesses get in for bad press as well, you know, for, for not sort of playing, playing ball, uh, whether businesses or organisations such as the university, the hospitals, BMW, all our big sort of, uh, contributors to the sort of commercial and industrial economy in, in Oxford uh, or the government gets the blame from all everyone and, and the government in turn blames local councils for not doing enough so it's very easy to get into that game of, of blaming people and if you do that you just get nowhere so what I'm going to try to do is, is avoid that and just say what's necessary to actually deliver a net zero Oxford and really everyone needs to do more and everyone needs to work together. So that's a simple message of, of, of that really. So um, we need to sort of tackle uh, climate change. We need some basic principles to work with. And uh, people will probably be familiar with the three R's of sort of resource management, like you know, in the hierarchy, reduce, reuse, recycle. That's become a sort of common in our vocabulary. But uh, I felt that we needed some principles for the climate emergency because actually it's, it needs more R's than three. So I thought five would, was a good number. Um, and they wrap, wrap, you know, roughly in the same sort of hierarchy, you know, we need to sort of realign. We need to stop making things worse. We need to realign our society and realign our economy. Uh, and although it's, you know, I shouldn't have to say this, but I often find myself doing so is that because it's really obvious we need to stop making things worse and it's so easy 
for governments, for politicians, for all sorts of uh, businesses uh, to actually sort of say the right thing, even do the right thing, but also on the other hand, be doing something which makes things worse. So for example, you know, doing some great stuff around renewable energy, but then allowing new buildings to be built, which are energy guzzling, uh, inefficient um, construction. So, you know, similarly, you can say great things about let's build, bring in electric vehicles and, and, all, and infrastructure for that, but at the same time, you can build in new roads or new airports. And of course, it's a bit like trying to sort of fill a, a leaky bucket. You know, you just can't, you end up chasing your own tail. You just can't get things to work and to add up and you make everything far more difficult for yourself if you don't do that realignment first. And then the other thing is, is reduce is to change behaviours, to reduce consumption. And there's lots of things that can be done locally around that. But, you know, supporting public education, putting yourself uh, you know, or your business or your institution or organisations on a sort of carbon reduction or even your lifestyle on a carbon reduction trajectory and be a climate champion to make a uh, noise, uh, whether it's uh, in politics or whether it's in media or within your own organisation. And the other thing is replace. We need to sort of introduce low or zero carbon alternatives to things we do uh, need in everyday uh, life, whether it's renewables for energy or electric vehicles, whether it's changing dietary habits, uh, reducing waste, and just critically evaluating everything we do and buy from a climate angle. Uh, fourth R is replenish. You know, as, it, as I spoke about removals uh, earlier, we need to invest in nature. We need to repair uh, damaged ecosystems, whether it's sort of global forests or whether it's sort of local parks, uh, agriculture, just to enhance our carbon stores. The, the biggest opportunities for carbon stores are, you know, ocean soils and forests and, and other plants. So those sort of things have a huge, huge um, impact on, on carbon. Most people don't realise is, is currently about half of the emissions we emit uh, from fossil fuel use globally are reabsorbed by the oceans, by forests, by soils. And that's why it's really important to protect our existing forests at, at every level, whether it's a local forest, whether it's a local green space, or um, whether it's sort of globally, the, the Amazon rainforest. Uh, oceans also absorb a huge amount. And again, we need to protect, protect those. It's one of the dangers of relying on these existing the sources of, of um, carbon sinks they're called to remove carbon from the atmospheres we don't know how stable they are and how long they're going to continue to absorb uh, carbon dioxide so clearly we have deforestation as well which is causing some reduction in some of our most important carbon stores so it's really important as a fourth R to, to invest in nature and we need to do it all rapidly the sooner we can do it the lower our carbon budget and the more time we buy ourselves it, it, uh, if you put it like that, to actually uh, invest and innovate and develop new technologies and bring more people on side. So um, this is a sort of chart. I mean, it's quite easy to sort of pat ourselves on the back a bit, and, and maybe we should do it to an extent, is that the UK is doing, uh, has reduced its emissions, and Oxford has reduced their emissions quite substantially. I'll just normalise this to, to the year. 2005 so year 2005 is 100 and then you can see that we're about 40 percent lower uh, in 2018 which is the latest year for which data is available um, so we're about 40 percent reduction from 2005 you know based on that data set that's been consistently recorded from government um, so that means we've reduced uh, oxford's emissions by around 30,000 uh, tons of, of co2 a year so we should be patting ourselves on the back for that you know because if you projected that line forward and assuming you could keep up that pace of reductions we would probably hit zero not net zero but just zero emissions by about 2042 so it seems on the face of it that we're doing well in oxford maybe it's less less sort of patting ourselves on the back when we look at other local authorities and that's the average for other local authorities is that they're also reducing at a similar rate <clears throat> to, to Oxford. So there's nothing we're particularly doing in Oxford that's different from anywhere else. And the reason why we're seeing these emission reductions consistently across all local authorities across the whole of the UK is down 90% of it's down to one thing, which is decarbonisation of the grid. So the UK has been very successful at reducing 
uh, uh, the amount of carbon emitted from the use of electricity. So electricity has been decarbonized very successfully. Now that's a sort of gift that only gives on, that won't give, keep on giving because we can only go down to uh, decarbonize by a certain amount at a certain rate. And then we'll have to deal with all the other sources of, of emissions, you know, the coal, the gas, the oil. Uh, so we can only go so far. Uh, but you can see why people are talking about electrification as the way forward, because if we can continue to decarbonize our grid whilst at the same time increasing capacity, uh, then we've got a chance of reaching net zero emissions. <clears throat> so, uh, and I talked about the need to do things quickly. Um, and you can see that green line is sort of projected <clears throat> excuse me, roughly down a straight line. You can see we get to sort of net zero point C there about 2042. Most people, you know, it's going to get harder, of course, and a lot harder uh, as we, we try to squeeze more and more emission reductions out of our local economy. And so most people think we're going to follow a trajectory more like sort of the blue dotted line. Uh, so we're going to get down to sort of 20% um, by about sort of 2050. 20% reductions against 2005 by about sort of 2050. And that's probably at the level when we're gonna to have to think about uh, removals. So we're probably gonna end up having to remove about that last 20% about sort of, um, for Oxford, it's about sort of 200,000 tonnes of, of CO2 uh, from, with enhanced um, nature-based solutions or carbon capture and storage. But I still would urge the importance of, of following as closely as we can the green line. And the reason is we hit that 20% a lot sooner. And if we hit ourselves that line uh, a lot sooner, we buy ourselves some time uh, to innovate some more. And we buy ourselves actually time beyond 2050 because it's about the carbon budget as well, which is the area under the line. And so the more, the, as much as we can reduce the area under the line, that gives us more time to innovate and introduce more of the, the removal technologies to, to tackle that last 20%. So if you talk to sort of government and a government committee on climate change, which is an excellent organization, they've got some really good guidance on sort of sort of quick, simple, low cost, uh, quick wins, if you like, for low. And, and it's interesting of all the four quick wins they give, all of them are things that pretty much can be actioned at a local level. So, you know, we can do more to, to build more solar capacity, renewable energy capacity locally, whether it's on roofs of our homes or on buildings, or whether it's sort of solar farms. We can also work on making our buildings more efficient uh, through insulation, uh, tree planting we can certainly do, and, you know, uh, improve recycling rates. Indeed, it's sort of council's responsibilities to, to look at uh, Recycle rate. So there is all things just as the sort of quick wins. It's quite interesting that those are all things that are within the power and influence of local councils. So I'd just like to go through, uh, and this is where I start talking the numbers. I'm trying to, to avoid doing too much uh, detail, but I'll, so, I'll, so I'll sort of go over some of the, the options for reducing our emissions and how we get down to that sort of final 20%. So the big emitters in Oxford are buildings and transport. You know, it's, act, it's buildings and activities that are done within buildings. So industrial and commercial and transport, obviously agriculture and land use is not, not huge impact. Waste is not a huge impact. And I guess I should have said earlier is that the data sets that we're working with do exclude certain things. It's quite difficult to capture things like uh, dietary change because the food that we eat is, is grown outside of the city. Uh, it's quite difficult to capture things like, you know, flying less because that happens outside the city. Um, international travel is generally a sort of challenge to capture, even for the Paris Agreement, which doesn't include international shipping or international aviation. Uh, so this is obviously working within the constraints of that data set. Doesn't mean say these other things aren't, you know, critically important, but they be dealt with within another sort of data standard and accounting standard, if you like. Um, so um, there are many different scenarios for reducing emissions and I'm just going to go through sort of one which I think is reasonably realistic, uh, challenge, very challenging but, but realistic. It depends of course on you know, level of aspiration, uh, your political commitment, what funding is available, 
how relevant some of these things are are locally. You know, it's no point trying to sort of look at offshore wind in Oxford, for example. Uh, and even hydro is is challenging, but we do have some hydro in, in Oxford. Um, but you know, the uh, capacity to deliver the skills to deliver the ability to influence emitters, so this you know willingness to behaviour change, and and choice editing, which maybe I'll, I'll talk about. A little bit later about how much we're willing to stop people doing things. Um, so let's look at transport. You can see from here down to here. Uh, by 2050, uh, you can see the sorts of things we'll have to do by 2025, 2030 and 2050 to, to achieve 19% reductions in our carbon emissions from the transport sector. Um, so looking at 2050 there, you can see we'll need to do 20, you know, drive 25% less by car. Um, we need a, a modal switch uh, away from car to other forms of, of more sustainable transport. And we have to have electrified our cars, our buses and our rail. Now rail electrification is already on the cards for, for rail services that, that serve Oxford. Uh, and there's, there's moves on, on buses and cars. So I'll just maybe show you a couple of those initiatives which are working. Yeah, and someone's just asked a very good question about trade. So they also exclude products which are made overseas and imported. So those are also outside the boundaries. Of that. So when we're talking about waste, we're just talking about the, manage the emissions from the management of that waste rather than the emissions embodied, embedded in the goods that, that we consume. So um, connecting Oxford is one of the initiatives that's looking at modal shift and looking at try to sort of reduce car use. Uh, you, you might have heard about some of the quite controversial plans around bus gates around the city and by sort of blocking off certain routes uh, across town. And that's really trying to tackle sort of the medium distance sort of travel and encourage reduced use of car and increase modal switch to bus. So this is some of the things that, that start to impact and deliver against those transport targets. Um, these are low traffic neighbourhoods. This is one in my own area. Uh, the council, as the county council, just won some funding from government to deliver seven of these with, within Oxford City, and they all start to have a, a big impact on shorter journeys. So encourage more modal shift and reductions in car use on shorter journeys. So if they're successful, and there's obviously um, like a lot of these things, some resistance, and so it depends how how sort of uh, gutsy the politicians are at pushing it through. Um, and also this is a really interesting project, which not that many people know about, but it's actually being built now on the outskirts of Oxford. I, I visited it the other day and it's sort of the groundworks have been done. It's based at a sub existing substation um, out to the east of the city. It's actually a sort of energy super hub, so like it's a sort of huge battery bank, um, which is going to be uh, used both to make our local grid more resilient for uses of renewable energy so we can have more local renewables uh, this allows the grid to, to cope with those local renewables by storing the energy uh, and releasing it locally at different times but also it, it, it includes the, um, the the implementation of a new high voltage line uh, which will stretch around oxford uh, to the redbridge park and ride you can see from the little diagram there or link Thornhill and Seacourt park and rides. And it will provide uh, very, very fast electric vehicle charging, uh, not just for private cars, but also for buses and you know last mile delivery vehicles. So we're talking about sort of 150 kilowatt charging. So that's almost sort of petrol station speeds for filling up your electric car. So those high voltage cables will be really important enabler for the electrification of vehicles across the city. So quite a lot going on. So let's have a look about uh, next the sort of so about reductions due to domestic sectors that sort of homes, uh, people's homes. We need to do a lot to retrofit existing properties in Oxford. Um, we can overall reduce the emissions by 44% when we add the transport to domestic emission reductions. But it's really about retrofitting homes at the rate of something around 2000 a year, um, because we have a lot of very old uh, inefficient properties within the city. All new homes from now need to be built to passive house standard. And if people aren't familiar with passive house standards, it's a sort of very energy efficient standard to the point where you don't need heating 
because you know your body heat and and waste heat from appliances and cooking and things is sufficient to heat the home so essentially zero heating uh, houses and, and they can also be because they're so energy efficient they can also be very easily powered by renewables so most of passive houses have built-in integrated renewables so they become you know net zero they normally have a grid connection but they become sort of a net zero uh, home and we have some ex examples of those um, in the city already and i noticed that my colleague dick wolf was on the call earlier i don't know if he's still there but he lives in a net zero uh, house which was just a standard uh, bog standard off off the shelf um, new build very inefficiently built but he patched it up uh, put some solar panels on it introduced sort of battery bank and and managed to turn it into not just a net zero but a positive uh, contribution to the grid to, into a sort of mini power station um, so we we need to do that we need to make sure all houses are built to that standard and then we also need to start to electrify our heating system so once we've reduced the amount of heat demand we can start to electrify and that means things like um, ground source and air source heat pumps, um, smarter heating controls, and we also need to, to deliver huge reductions uh, in our energy use from appliances, you know, fridges and washing machines and dishwashers and things like that, as well as cooking on all electric. So again, <clears throat> there are some sort of examples of this already, just starting up. In Oxford, there's Cozy Hobes Oxford, which is a retrofitting service for your home. Uh, I did this, you can see the sort of report uh, about how to turn my house into a net zero house and reducing my bills uh, by half in the process. Um, that's just the summary there. Um, but essentially what you do is an expert will come along and assess your home and give you a plan. Here's how you can make your house sort of net zero. Um, mine's a very old house, so I would have to plant some trees at the end of it. Um, or do some other sort of mitigation measures. Um, this is just really about the fabric of the building. So it doesn't include the fact that I've already got solar panels on my house. I've already got sort of uh, water, solar water heating uh, and have already done some, some work on the house, but actually it's quite interesting. And it even had a few surprises about things that I could improve in house. So, so it's worthwhile doing uh, yeah, and it's the start of that retrofitting, but we need to really up the scale and to deliver against that you know 2000 homes a year retrofitted is, is a significant ask um there's also this hasn't yet come to oxford but i really hope it will soon this is uh, energy sprawl uh, which started off in the netherlands which is sort of a mass uh, retrofitting of a, a row of houses or a block of houses uh, together and it begin, brings about sort of economies of scale uh, so, and it's been trialled initially, uh, uh, they just had a very successful scheme in Nottingham um, and it's been used for social homes uh, initially because the, the model works, the business model works a lot better with uh, social homes and essentially what happens is the tenants continue to pay the levels of bills they were paying before, paying before the refurbishment uh, but you borrow money to, to improve their properties uh, and then you um, use the money that, that they would have otherwise paid for bills to pay back the, the sort of um, investment that you've done in that property. So normally within 30 years, you can actually pay back the cost uh, from, the, the, from the savings in bills that people would have made, uh, otherwise would have paid. So beyond 30 years, then they become a lot cheaper homes to live in. But up to that point, it's no more cost to the tenant than they otherwise would have got if the home had remained unfurnished unrefurbished. So let's look at uh, agriculture. Um, there's not many opportunities within Oxford to sort of reduce uh, emissions from agriculture because we don't have a huge amount in the city but it is important that you know if, if you do look it's surprising there's about sort of 26 percent of the city is woodland or grassland you know places like Port Meadow and the sort of natural corridor running through the centre of the city along the Charwa River. Uh, so it's really important that we retain these and protect them, do more tree planting where possible, you know, properly manage those parks and nature corridors. And as I said earlier, sort of benefits of dietary change in local fresh foods are not captured within the data set we're using for the city. But those are also important things to encourage as well and will be on top of these sorts of savings. 
Um, what about waste? So we can reduce by another sort of percent by, by um, increasing levels of recycling and reducing the amount of household waste that's produced. So about 2050, we need to be as, as households recycling at least 85% on average. It's about what I'm doing now and what good recyclers are doing now. So it's not a, a huge ask, but we do need to bring the average up to that level. Uh, some local authorities near to Oxford are doing similar levels, 70, 80%, so it is perfectly achievable. And maybe this is somewhere where we'd want to be more ambitious than the, this sort of scenario I've presented here. And we need to also uh, decrease the amount of household waste that's actually being produced by around about 20%. So I left the most difficult sort of sector, the industrial and commercial sector to last <clears throat> because it's such a diverse sector. Um, in, in Oxford, it will cover things like BMW, universities, hospitals, the city and the county councils, as well as all the offices and retail premises. So it's a very diverse sector. So quite difficult to draw sort of, uh, really need to be look at tailored solutions for each um, business and organization. Uh, but you can draw some sort of general, do some general sort of modelling, you know, uh, where there's industrial processes, we need to see those, you know, more efficient by the order of sort of 40%. Uh, the, um, the amount of electricity that's used, the, the proportion of the electricity use is about 35% now, needs to go up to 66%. So we need to sort of double, around about double the amount of electricity used, you know, displacing other, other forms of energy. Um, where CO2 is produced, you know, through local power plants, we need to capture that CO2 or a large portion of it. <coughs> and similar to domestic properties, we need to go 100% electric on heating and also have significant reductions in the energy use of appliances and lighting. So we've got down through that, I've rapidly gone through one possible set of scenarios and we've, you know, in that process reduced um, emissions from 2005 levels by 85% and 2018 uh, by 78%. So we've really got down to that sort of final 15 to 20%. And, and you might have noticed I haven't really talked about energy um, because that um, thread runs through all those different scenarios um, because we've talked a lot about energy demand management and switching to, to Electricity. And also it depends a lot on grid decarbonisation. So we're dependent to an extent on what's happening nationally in terms of decarbonising the grid. But the sorts of things it means for Oxford is that we need to have 50% of homes fitted with solar by 2050. Uh, and we've got about 2% now. So that gives you, we need to increase by 25 times the amount. Uh, we need to increase by 40 times the amount of roof mounted solar or solar farms. So we do have quite a few examples like bus, bus garage in, in East Oxford and there's some uh, industrial buildings on, um, along uh, the Botley Road and various other places that do have sort of roof mounted solar. We do need to increase that massively by about 40 times what we have now. We need to also either you know have onshore wind turbines and these will probably be outside of Oxford but serving Oxford. Um, so we've got, you know, uh, West Mill Wind Farm, which is just outside Oxford, which was mainly funded by the community within Oxford. Uh, so we need sort of 10 more West Mills um, serving Oxford around about, could be anywhere around the country, but, you know, uh, community energy is better when it's more local. We need battery storage. The energy super hub is already there. We might need another one or to upgrade the technology in that. We need hydro, far more than we can... Um, actually generate within Oxford, but we need uh, more hydro schemes serving the city and anaerobic digesters, again, something which is unlikely to be within Oxford, but within the surrounding sort of hinterland um, and 20 times more anaerobic digesters we currently have. We just have one um, Cassington at the moment serving the city. So you can see how we need to have more of a county-wide energy strategy to address some of these, these things. Oxford itself, you know, uses about a quarter of the energy of the whole county, uh, but obviously we need to also come up with a strategy which serves the needs of the other districts within the city and the, the county, and, uh, and to come up with a holistic energy strategy. There is an Oxfordshire energy strategy, which is quite old now, but it looks at how we can reduce um, energy use and carbon emissions by about 50% across the county. That needs to be updated to include some of this more recent modeling, and it needs to apply that to not just Oxford City, but, but the other 
uh, South Oxfordshire, Vale of Whitehorse, Charwell and uh, West Oxfordshire. So um, we've now we've got down to that sort of final 20%. Um, what are the options for reducing it further? And I say mainly it's in the industrial and commercial space. Uh, lots of opportunities for new technology, for more efficient solar, for hydrogen is a, is a big um, possibility. Lots of people talking about uh, use of hydrogen that has the advantage that you can use it for, for vehicles or industrial processes um, where uh, solar electricity might might not be as suitable. Uh, we can be more ambitious at some of the scenarios I've presented. Um, we can look at the use of more bio-based materials. Um, we can do more centralized or decentralized green power generation. And we can also look at investing in forests and soils, carbon capture and storage, uh, power, what are called PPAs, power purchase agreements. So we can actually uh, Oxford could invest, as Warrington has done as a council, in a sort of solar farm that's outside of Oxford, but build it there and you know have that power servicing uh, Oxford's economy. More biomass, and we need to do some stuff on the oceans. Obviously, we don't have any oceans near Oxford, but there's lots of things, again, we could invest in projects, ocean projects. I'm involved in quite an interesting project that's around seaweed, where you can actually um, sort of take um, grow more seaweed in the oceans, seed the oceans with seaweed. It grows very quite quickly. It absorbs huge amounts of carbon dioxide, removes that from the atmosphere. It can then be harvested and used for fertilizer. And so again, it displaces artificial fertilizers. So there's lots of really quite innovative projects which are going on there that looks at how we can increase the capacity of our sort of natural carbon sinks uh, to actually absorb more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and hence deal with this final 20% of emissions uh, where they're not already dealt with by technologies and other uh, improvements in and ambition or demand. So I feel I sort of should say a little bit more about behaviour change because that's such a, a, a large and important area, the sort of second R in this list. Um, and I mentioned a little bit earlier about choice editing, which is a bit of a sort of bugbear of mine, is that, um, the, and, and it's I find it interesting because it's where sort of cap the capitalism, you know, in a conventional sense, sense meets um, environmentalism. So we know certain things are bad, but capitalism says people, have, consumers have choice, they should be able to do things if they're willing to pay for them, and the way to, you know, stop people from doing things is maybe to charge a higher fee or, or to sort of make things bureaucratically more challenging to do. Um, so, you know, you can drive a large car if you've got money to do it. We might tax you more on it and tax fuel, but, you know, that's fine. You can still do it. Um, you can buy unhealthy food. You know, you can produce a lot of waste. You know, we'll try and stop you doing that through persuasion, through maybe some fines or taxes, um, but you can still do that. Choice editing is about saying, if things are bad, no, you can't do it. Um, and it's about re restricting choice. And that's where environmentalism butts up against capitalism and where it's quite an interesting area for me is that interface and how we, we manage that interface. Uh, there are some really good examples. So the EU banned incandescent light bulbs a few years ago. A lot of people complained about it, but now no one gives it second thought. You can't buy in energy inefficient incandescent light bulbs. Um, the government's talked about banning fossil fuel cars, um, whether, uh, in fact, there's some exceptions and, and it might not, not happen in quite the way that it's, this is envisaged now. But, you know, we should know that if cars are energy inefficient cars or energy efficient buildings, you should just not be allowed to build them or not be allowed to drive them or buy them. So that's quite a challenging area for topic and maybe someone wants to, to bring, bring that up in the questions. Um, because uh, we do need to uh, address that. Uh, we need more sort of light bulb moments, as it were, to actually uh, say, no, things are bad. And you might think that's not very relevant to Oxford and how does that work? But we have some examples here. You know, we do charge uh, fees and get some revenue from um, various activities that the council does where we could apply that same thinking. So one thing uh, that comes to mind is, you know, we're planning a sort of low emission zone in the city centre that's going, that's intended to improve air quality and deter people from using the car in the city. But rather than saying, no, if you've got a high emitting vehicle, you can't come in. 
we've actually said, no, you can come in as long as you pay. So there's really challenges like that where choice editing is important. We should say, I think, if certain things are bad, we know they're bad, they're not sustainable, we should just remove that choice from the table. That's what choice editing is and why I think it's quite an interesting area for discussion and a challenging area to talk about that people might want to, to bring up. Um, so I just thought I'd end with some examples of things that I think are, are good um, it's, um, and have been quite successful in Oxford and things that we should be building upon. Um, I, th I think these sorts of interventions and measures are really successful when you can combine some benefits, you know, so let's talk about, you know, this is an example of a car sharing scheme. So I, I established a car sharing scheme, community car sharing scheme in Oxford. East Oxford some time ago, which ended up merging, combining with Commonwealth, which is a not-for-profit uh, national car sharing scheme. <clears throat> and, it, and it has a lot of benefits. It's not just about reducing greenhouse gases and they, they have electric vehicles now, which you can, you can rent by the hour. It encourages a diversity of transport use, so you're less likely to use the car because they're not sitting outside waiting for you to use. You don't, don't cover the, have the cost of ownership. Uh, it obviously improves the air quality and benefits health. It's to, uh, com conducive to community ownership, so it brings communities together. It obviously reduces the need for private car ownerships. It's more flexible pricing, uh, more adaptable. You can have a range of vehicles depending on what your, your needs are. So, and also, you know, for each car club car, it's been proven you get rid of 15 cars. So 15 private cars are, uh, are normally sort of no longer required if you have one for each car club car. So there's, there's a good example of how we've got a carbon reduction scheme, which could be scaled up a lot more than it is, that also has various co-benefits. Uh, there's community investment in renewable energies. The Oxford Low Carbon Hub, extremely successful. Uh, in Oxford, it's the most successful one of its uh, community energy of its kind, but of its kind in, in Europe. Uh, and it actually sort of takes investment from individuals, from organizations, and actually invests that back into the county in local renewable energy and um, uh, insulation schemes. So um, I, I worked with them to set up a Lord Mayor's Climate Fund when I was Lord Mayor, uh, which helped to bring in an additional source of revenue to that, to that fund. And they're just launching another community investment round, uh, which you can then sort of invest in. And you get a return. So it's sort of, again, it's like, think of it like an alternative to the banks. In a sense, it has another co-benefit actually generates uh, revenue makes your money work for the environment. Um, this is something that maybe could be done that isn't being done. Um, you know, there's huge opportunities. We have huge park and ride car parks uh, scattered around the city that are just tarmac, and there have been plans drawn up, although not implemented, to to put sort of solar canopies on them. Uh, and it's about two kilowatts per car space, so it's significant amount of energy that could be generated. There are challenges with, with grid connection points, but these are things which are easily surmountable. And so there are huge opportunities there to make better use of land and to generate more renewable energy and you know, start delivering some of those large scale uh, solar arrays and solar farms that we need uh, by 2050. One area is where the city also needs to do better is in, in housing, new housing which is constructed and there's just a picture there of new ones that have been built recently in, in Barton. Um, are not up to the standard which they should be. Um, you know, this is a, a picture there of Bedzeb, which is a development I worked on more than 10 years ago now, <coughs> which was very successful. Overall cost of ownership is lower. Um, they didn't cost a huge amount more to build. Uh, and we really should be saying, again, back to choice editing, we shouldn't be allowing people to build houses which are not to passive house standards, which cannot easily be retrofitted or come delivered with, with solar uh, and are totally net zero. The technology is available, we know the whole life costs are lower. There are good examples within Oxfordshire of the, why, where this is being done, so we shouldn't be allowing those sorts of developments to go ahead. And not just uh, residential, but also commercial buildings. And Oxford's local plan doesn't have any target for zero carbon uh, commercial buildings. So I'll, in the last sort of few minutes, I'll just talk a little bit about funding because it's often a question about um, about funding, where does the money come from? Um, well, cost estimates to achieve sort of net zero, uh, and there's been quite a few studies done at the UK level, at the global level, at the European level, 
Um, and, and the sort of estimates are remarkably similar. It costs about one to three percent of gross domestic product. Um, for the UK, that's approximately 30 or 50 billion a year, which sounds a lot of money. It is a lot of money, but COVID is probably going to cost us 300 billion in the first year. So that's six years of a transitionary money to a, a, to a zero carbon UK. And Brexit could cost us, and the estimates vary hugely depending on whether or not we get a deal. Um, but you know, around 100 billion a year ongoing. So you know, double the cost of what it would take us to transition to a net zero carbon economy by 2050. And unlike some of these huge costs of COVID or Brexit, uh, investment in climate change actually pays back. So most, again, most of the studies have looked at it. So it's not just, it's an investment and it does deliver returns. And typically after about 30 years, you've got your initial investment back. And I won't go through this, but anyone who's interested in all those costs analysis by sector in great detail, there's a, a, a great book called Drawdown, which actually goes through in detail all the different interventions you can do. And it's at a global level, but um, and it goes through those costs and the savings. And in almost all cases, um, the net savings over 30 years exceed the net costs. So that's drawdown.org. And once you start to sort of think about this, for me, it was a bit of a light bulb moment. I realized that it's not really a problem of funding. It's just a problem of cash flow. And then you can start to think in different ways about how you would fund that transition. So there's a whole range of ways through government borrowing, pension funds, who are to taxation, private investment, community investments, quantitative easing, so printing more money, or redirecting existing spending from fossil fuel subsidies. So there's a whole range once you start to say, well, it's a cash flow problem. Where do we get the cash? We know we're going to be paying it back over time. Then you have a whole range of different opportunities and options for, for funding the transition. Um, and so what are the barriers leaving you with these questions, really? What, what do you think then are the barriers and why aren't we able to move more quickly, more rapidly to a zero carbon world? Is it indeed ideological? <coughs> Are there technological challenges? Is it behavioural? Is it financial? Do we lack the information we need or is it political? And that's a, a great quote from Greta Thunberg there about we all have the choice. We can safeguard living conditions for future generations or we can continue with business as usual and fail. And that uh, photograph is from the climate protests from Oxford last year. That seems a long time ago now, but the, the girl in the middle is my daughter who's 19 years old. And like other generations and others of her generation, she will either have to bear the brunt of our inaction or be a beneficiary of our sort of wise choices. So with that, I will end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Craig. That was wonderfully illuminating and accessible. So mm. I'm very grateful to you for that. We already have some questions. The first one is about electric cars. And it, it's about the, the problems as well as the benefits of electric cars and the components needed to make them. I wonder if you could talk about that. Yeah, so there's a little bit of a myth around that. Um, <clears throat> it's certainly true that, you know, manufacturing ba batteries is an energy intensive process at the moment. But it's also the case, is that, the case that batteries and the components of batteries can be almost infinitely recycled. So... Um, so I think that's sort of, if you take that into account, then overall operationally, of course, electric vehicles are hugely more efficient. They use energy more efficiently as well as using a form of energy, which is lower carbon. And even if you take the manufacturing of the batteries into account, which is the, the thing that differentiates them from fossil fuel cars and take into account that they're recyclable uh, and then it's they're far better to have electric vehicles. But in, in a sense, the question is right, is that, you know, it's something that we, we need to reduce private car use overall. It's not just a matter of everyone switching to electric cars. So that's the, certainly the case. And that's why a lot of the scenarios look at, you know, reductions and modal switches, because we do need to drive less in private transport. And we do need to also uh, just, just be more efficient and, and mode switch to other forms of transport. You touched on the question of the use of hydrogen and mm. your colleague Wolf has posted a question about this. 
He has said Chris Goodall has argued for a hydrogen economy, particularly important when it comes to space heating and transport, especially heavy vehicles. The government has recently included hydrogen generation in its Green New Deal equivalent. Do you see hydrogen as a key requirement? Yeah, no, I mentioned it at the end because it's an area which is emerging and there's not a lot of modelling being done around, certainly the op opportunities in Oxford. Um, but there are starting to look, certainly the, the study I showed about the UK net zero report, which I'd recommend people are interested in, in this read. Um, that certainly uh, has a lot about hydrogen there. And the, the benefits of hydrogen is it can tackle some of that remaining 20% of emissions by looking at heavy freight, which is the main challenge for electric. It's very difficult. We've got things like electric dust carts. <coughs> and electric sort of short range vehicles and vans and we can see those being practical at the moment in fact we're trialing an electric uh, dust cart in Oxford at the moment um, but some of these long distance freight whether it's shipping or whether it's sort of a lorry freight or the hydrogen is probably going to be the best solution for that otherwise we're just going to have to find more carbon removals uh, to get rid of that final 20 percent. Thank you. We have two questions from the same person. One is, in terms of changing individual habits, how much carrot and how much stick? And is there a network of information exchange between Oxford and other councils around the country, business and central government? Um, that's a good, the second one is a good question. I have to think about that. Maybe someone else knows of something. There are obviously lots of government organizations like the Local Government Association, uh, and there's a lot of big sort of conference round and, and online resources that, that local authorities can share uh, case studies um, and showcase. So, you know, whenever there is a big uh, project, normally government funded, because these things are quite expensive to pilot, um, like the sort of not, uh, examples we've got of the Energy Super Hub in Oxford, which came from government funding. Um, we make every effort to sort of showcase that to other local authorities to have open days and conferences around it. So I think a lot of that um, networking exchange happens at that level where you showcase a particular project. But certainly in terms of ongoing exchanges, that's mainly done through existing channels around sort of local government association and organizations like that. Uh, changing habits, carrot and stick. <coughs> Sorry, let me try. Um, well, that's really what the point I was getting to with the choice editing. Um, there's a lot of carrot at the moment and not very much stick. Um, it's a very difficult area to discuss and get that balance right. But I think we do need to, to equitably, I don't think we need to sort of um, discriminate, but we just need to say, look, these sort of things are not great. They're not good for the environment. Uh, then we need to stop them like the energy efficient light bulbs example. We need to do more like that. And that's actually less regressive than some of the measures at the moment. So just take the example I gave of driving into the city centre in Oxford. Um, we're allowing rich people, wealthy people to go in and to pollute, you know, to pay to pollute. And that's very regressive. That's very inequitable. And I think it's, it's better for society if we just say that's bad. You shouldn't be able to do that. Doesn't matter how much money you've got, you know, um, what access you have to things. This is, you know, bad things shouldn't be allowed. It's a change we need to make that more acceptable. We saw with the, in London with the low traffic neighbourhoods introduced in local um, neighbourhoods and streets. So there were a lot of protests. People thought they were sort of blocking their right to, to drive their car down the street um, because low traffic neighbourhoods stop through traffic, rat running traffic, but they still allow vehicle access to every property on a street. Um, but still people found that was was too much. Interestingly enough, about 40% of people objected to low traffic neighbourhoods before they went in. A recent follow-up study in London shows that only about 2% would want to go back to the way it was. So most of these changes, even though it might involve a bit of stick to start off with, people in the end probably feel like they were more carrots. Next question uh, begins with a thank you. Thank you for a balanced talk. A footnote, mm -hmm. perhaps. Incandescent light bulbs are a good example, as they were replaced by efficient light bulbs in a broader variety, hence the choice was effectively widened. But we should be careful about limiting means of travel without providing comparable, workable options. Consider families with vulnerable members who may prefer to have the freedom of their own car 
or mm. live in a not so well serviced area, or the obvious necessity for long distance travel. You can't board a train to get to the US, not even to some parts of Europe, and so on. Yeah. So there's going to be very difficult decisions around long distance travel um, because there's no doubt about it is that we have to do, we have to sort of cap the growth and we probably in the future have to do less of it or do some investment in things like biofuels or hydrogen powered planes. There's a very good chance, uh, certainly before 2050, probably in the next 10 years, that we will have electric planes that can do medium distance up to about four hours. So anywhere within sort of Europe, and slightly beyond that, uh, you'd probably be able to do it with electrically powered aircraft. They're already being uh, designed and tested. Uh, longer distance than that, over to the States, for example, and, and Far East, um, are going to be a, a challenge. I don't think we're going to have ready solutions in place. We can't see at the moment what those solutions might be. There's obviously been a transatlantic flight that Virgin did where they ran on biofuels. Um, so these things are possible, but we're a long, long way off making those sort of commercially viable uh, and making those at the scale that's necessary. And we know biofuels have an unwanted sort of adverse effect if we use agricultural land to, to create those biofuels. So we're talking about second and third generation biofuels made from wastes, uh, and they're still some way off from um, microorganisms, and they're still some way off being developed. What about the problem of an elderly or less physically able person being able to come from their home to get food as supermarkets move increasingly out of town and Oxford's buses yeah. aren't the best? I mean, to, to get from South Oxford to North Oxford requires two buses and a walk to get from South Oxford to East Oxford similarly. Yeah. Uh, as we restrict individual personal transport and as we restrict traffic, what can we do about that? Well, there's a number of different solutions we've already seen through COVID. You know, people can get deliveries. Um, and, you know, people like Amazon and Waitrose and others are, are sort of piloting, you know, electric local delivery vehicles. We already have Pedal and Post that does vehicles by bicycle, deliveries by bicycle. So I think we'll see that's going to be partially what's going to happen. We'll see a switch to more delivery services. We've already seen that, I think what's happened during lockdown to an extent will be locked in. Those will be some behavior change there. We'll see more people, you know, the goods come to them rather than people go to the goods. Um, but, you know, we're not talking about stopping all car use. As I said, it's still, it's electrification of car. And it's a, I think I put down 25% reduction by 2050 in car use and an 18% modal shift. So we're still going to see significant car use. And that's maybe an area where some people think we should be more ambitious and say, not just a switch to 100% electric vehicles, we should be reducing the use of vehicle, private vehicles more drastically. So, um, so I think there's still, uh, you know, there's no way that any of the scenarios I've shown would stop, you know, vulnerable people using an electric car to go somewhere. And elect the range of electric vehicles is increasing all the time, as well as the charging opportunities. I said the, um, the energy super hub and the high voltage cable around Oxford will mean you can charge up your electric car as quickly as you could fill up at a petrol station. Okay. So, <coughs> know how ready is the new Lord Mayor to make the changes needed for a net zero Oxford? Well, it's sort of, uh, we're not like the sort of Mayor of London or the Mayor of Manchester or indeed many of the sort of mayors around the world. We don't have executive power, sadly. Um, well, sadly, it's sort of it's more of a ceremonial role, but I think you know we, we have soft influence as, as civic office holders where we can talk more about these things, push publicly, promote things publicly. So, um, which is what what I've used my term in office. I think the new Lord Mayor is is you know has his own priorities, but I think it's really for the council as a whole to take forward these measures, and and a lot of the ones I've talked about are already in place and are already happening. I think it's now about sort of delivery and about prioritization. And we've seen some examples. Um, we've just had a new budget released for the city. Uh, I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. It's only released yesterday. Um, uh, and I'm on the committee that's gonna go through and, and scrutinize that. Uh, and obviously I'll be looking for where there's investment that's going into non-carbon reducing measures that could be diverted to carbon reducing measures. In the last budget, we had examples of six million pounds being spent on 
car park expansion, 60 million pounds being spent on acquiring commercial buildings. You know, all of these are investments that are significant and would move Oxford a lot closer to being zero carbon if those that funds weren't put into commercial buildings, but renewable energy, for example, and weren't put into, you know, expanding car parts, put into more sustainable transport options. So there's still a lot of lot we can do locally. And as I said, it's not about a blame game, Oxford blaming the county or government or blaming members of the public. It's really about just saying we'll work in partnership, but we really need to do what we can with it, with our money and with our constraints to actually deliver a lower carbon Oxford. The next question also begins with a thank you very much. Mm. And the question is, how can Oxford University best help with the city's plans to get to net zero? And what are the greatest current obstacles? Are there any areas in particular, e.g. buildings, where energy comes from, transport, etc., which you think students can have the most impact in focusing on when campaigning at the university? Um. So that's a great question. If, if you go back to sort of the scenarios I presented um, around sort of um, commercial buildings, you'll see some of the opportunities here. Sort of a lot of this, this is obviously pushes together sort of commercial and industrial um, emissions, but you know, a lot of these are relevant to, to institutional buildings. You know, for example, looking at sort of energy efficiency, um, moving to more electric cooking, uh, looking at sort of uh, reductions in energy use more generally. So those are sort of general areas of, of sort of movement. But the first place to start is really to do a sort of carbon study of your sort of university, of your halls of residence, um, and actually see where the sources of, of emissions are. And then really literally sort of get, get together a plan, bearing in mind the sort of general trajectory thing, way things are going, and start to prioritise action. It's a bit like the sort of... Um, survey I showed you of my house where there's sort of a, a sort of retrofitting plan for my house you need to do that for university buildings and then start to to sort of uh, identify cost benefits and each of those and start to tackle things once at one at a time. Thank you. Space heating question. is probably going to be the biggest yeah. The next question has been answered in the chat it was about whether hydrogen is explosive mm -hmm. and then after that regarding choice editing Mm. Has the concept of carbon rationing, I've just jumped, there's a new question has come in, got any traction? With rationing, mm. individuals have personal choice of how to use their budget. The rich can't pay to pollute. Well, it's a great question. I mean, there's not, there's not any tool, I don't think there's any significant movement at national level for carbon budgeting. I think it's, um, in a sense, you know, a, a carbon trajectory is a carbon budget. So, um, so you know, the the committee on government committee on climate change sets a series of carbon budgets for the UK as a whole, and those are divided up into sectors. So each sector has a particular target, and at the international level, the Paris Climate Agreement has, you know, nationally determined contributions, which are you know country level targets, within that country. They, they decide how to allocate those reductions across different sectors. So in a sense, each sector has a carbon budget and can choose how it wishes to spend that. Um, but it's really uh, not the fact that there's any sort of cap on that. It's actually quite easy for the moment for businesses just to ignore these sort of targets and just, just continue to, to emit. So, um, but, you know, having said that, you know, um, corporates, companies are being quite responsible generally. Um, I mean, I do mostly, my, most of my work is with companies, helping them to reach sort of net zero. Uh, and there's a sort of something called the Science Based Targets Initiative, which is an international effort where companies can um, measure, reduce and put in place a plan for, for net zero emissions. I've helped one company already get to net zero. Um, so it is certainly possible and achievable and financially viable. And in fact, most of these companies see considerable returns from doing so. So, um, so, so carbon rationing at that sense, but personal carbon rations uh, uh, haven't really, um, there's not really been traction on those. 
it pro if it did, it probably wouldn't come from government, but it might well come from one of these organisations who has its own carbon budget to work in and then tries to sort of um, provide that to uh, in some form or another to its customers. So I think that that might be the way that carbon budgeting, carbon rationing ends up working. I mean, I'm working with a couple of banks at the moment, quite interestingly, who who want to help individuals to manage their carbon through their purchases. Um, so it might be that that's also a way that through the banks that some sort of form of carbon information about carbon, if not carbon rationing, comes in. Okay. Next question is, can the startup community play a role? And how could the government slash local council support them if there is a way, since most systematic changes like the mass retrofitting idea seem to require quite some capital slash scale mm. to start with? Yet in this relatively market oriented economy, isn't nurturing and coordinating powerful disruptors easier than persuading incumbents to shift from the status quo? Yes, no, yeah, I mean, it's a really good point. And that, that's certainly true is some of the sort of entrenched heavy industries, um, you know, looking at the vehicle industry, even though BMW is switching to, to electric vehicles, it's done so very slowly. Meanwhile, we've had a whole range of sort of startup companies offering electric vehicles and building uh, electric vehicles, even within Oxfordshire, uh, which are not obviously anywhere near the scale of BMW, but they've managed to do that more quickly uh, and at a, a, at a reasonable cost. Um, there are um, Oxfordshire Green Tech, it's called Oxford Green, Oxfordshire Green Tech is a sort of organization which is trying to bring together, it's about 350 members in Oxfordshire, tries to bring together these sorts of organizations and provide access to funding and sort of give them exposure to investors. So that's a good place to start. I mean, there's a lot of money now coming from government, central government on a lot of these initiatives. And it's certainly organizations like Oxfordshire Green Tech can certainly help put you in contact with those sorts of um, very necessary organizations to, to develop and grow an idea. We'll be finishing soon, so if anyone has a final question, please type it into the chat now. And I'll just give you a minute to do that. Otherwise, I think you've given us a lot to think about and a lot to do. And I hope everyone will take away from this things that we can do both personally and in terms of encouraging organizations to do, including our, our own college, which does a lot to be green. We have a sustainability champion who's with us today, and that's Rodrigo Hernandez. Rodrigo, if you have any questions or comments, I, I know we'd be happy to receive those. Well, they're probably shy, but I'm very happy to sort of follow up if anyone has any questions and, and provide these slides to to anyone who's in, interested. Thank you very much. If you could send them to me, I, I will then forward them to anyone who asks. Very good. So, thank you so much for giving us so much of your time. We're getting lots of thanks posted onto the chat with people yeah. saying how useful this talk was. We're yeah. very grateful and we hope you, we see you again at Kellogg and in the council and around the city. So thank you. Yes, well, when we get out and about on my bicycle again, yeah. Yes, we'll wave at you if you pass. <laughs> yeah, there was just a question about the recording. Is the recording going oh, to yeah. be available? Yeah, with your permission, the recording will be available. Yeah, if we yeah. Have your happy to do that. And yes, it will be on the college website. Brilliant. Okay, well, thank you everyone for attending. It's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you, Shabazz, for your technical help and for setting this up. Yeah. So goodbye everyone okay. and thank Bye. you. Bye. Goodbye.